Great. Hello, everybody. I am Benjamin Rosenbaum, as you just heard. Somehow I omitted my novel from the bio. That was funny. Um, but that's what I'll be reading from, The Unraveling. Uh, it's a far future, coming of age, uh, buildings are on, something. You'll find out. Uh, so I'm going to read from the beginning of that. Oh, and let me set a timer so I don't eat all of Marianne's time. <laughs> Bift was almost five. And it wasn't like Zer to be asleep in all of Zer bodies. Z wasn't a baby anymore. Z was old enough for school. Old enough to walk all alone across the habitation, down the spoke, to the great and buzzing center of Fu. But Z had been wound up with excitement for days, practically dancing around the house. Father Missisk had laughed. Father Smistria had shooed her out of the supper garden. Father Frill had taken her to the bathing room to swim back and forth, back and forth to calm her down. Just before supper, Z finally collapsed twice in the atrium and curled up on the tiered balcony. Father Arevio and Father Squell had carried Zer in those two bodies back to Zer room. She'd managed to stay awake in Zer third body through most of supper, blinking hugely, breathing in through Zer nose and trying to sit up straight as waves of deep blue slumber from Zer two sleeping brains washed through Zer. By supper's end, she couldn't stand up any longer and Father Squell carried their last body to bed. Muddy dreams of sitting on a wooden floor in a long hall, of their name being called, of realizing Z hadn't worn their gowns after all, but was somehow, humiliatingly, dressed in Father Frill's golden bells instead. The other children all laughing at Zer and dizziness, and suddenly, surreally, the hall being full of flutterbys their translucent wings fluttering, their projection surfaces glittering. Then someone was stroking Fifth's eyebrow gently. She tried to nestle further down into the blankets, but the someone started gently pulling on her earlobe. She opens her eyes, and it was Father Squell. Good morning, little cobblehedge, V said. You have a big day today. Father Squell was slim and rosy-skinned, and smelled like soap and flowers. Fifth crawled into Squell's lap and flung their arms around them and pressed their nose between their bosoms. V was dressed in glittery red fabric, soft and slippery under Fifth's fingers. Squell was bald with coppery metal spikes extruding from the skin of her scalp. Sometimes Father Frill teased her about the spikes which weren't fashionable anymore. And sometimes that made Father Squell storm out of the room because he was a little vain. Father Squell had never been much of a fighter, the other fathers said, but he had a body in the asteroids and that was something amazing. Squell reached over, Fifth still in her lap and started stroking the eyebrow of another of Fifth's bodies. Fifth sneezed in that body and then sneezed in the other two. That was funny and Z started to giggle. Now Z was all awake. Up, little cobblehead, Squell said, up. Fifth crawled out of bed, careful not to crawl over herself. It always made her a little restless to be all together, all three bodies in the same room. That wasn't good. It was because their somatic integration wasn't totally successful, which is why Z kept having to see pedagogical expert Pnim Moralazic Foundelli of name registry pneumatic Lance 12. Pedagogical expert Pnim Moralazic Foundelli had put an awful nag agent in Fifth's mind. He tells her to look herself in the eye, and play in a coordinated manner, and do the exercises. It was nagging now, but Fifth ignored it. Z so looked under the bed for Zer gowns. They weren't there. Fifth closed Zer eyes. He wasn't so good at using the feed with them open yet, and looked all over the house. The gowns weren't in the balcony, or the atrium, or the small mat room, or the breakfast room. Father Zarevio Smil, uh, Father Zarevio Smistria Frill and another of Father Squell's bodies were in the breakfast room already eating. Father Missisk was arguing with the kitchen. Where are my gowns? Fifth asks their agents. But the agents 
didn't say anything. Maybe he was doing it wrong somehow. Father Squirrel said, opening her eyes, I can't find my gowns and my agents can't either. I composted your gowns. They were old, Squirrel said. Go down to the bathing room and get washed. I'll make you some new clothes. Fifth's heart began to pound. The gowns weren't old. They only came out of the oven a week ago. But I want those gowns, he said. Squell opened the door. You can't have those gowns. Those gowns are compost. Bathing. Be snatched fifth up. One of Zero bodies under Veer arm. The, tw the wrist of another caught in Veer other hand. Fifth was up in the air, wriggling, was held by the arm, pulling against Squell's grip, and was on Zer hands and knees by the bed, looking desperately under it for Zer gowns. They weren't old, Z said, Zer voice wavering. Fifth, Squell said, exasperated. That's enough for Kumru's sake. Today of all days, V dragged Fifth, or as much of Fifth as V managed to get a hold of, out the door. Another of Squell's bodies, this one with silvery spikes on its head, came hurrying down the hall. I want them back, Fifth said. He wouldn't cry. He wasn't a baby anymore. He was a big stage child, and stades don't cry. He wouldn't cry. He wouldn't even shout or emphasize. Today of all days, Z would stay calm and clear. Z was still struggling a little in Squell's arms. So Squell handled the struggling body off to himself as he came through the door. They are compost, Squell said, reddening in the body with the silver spikes. While the one of the copper spikes came into the room, they have gone down to sluice and dissolved. Your gowns are now part of the nutrient flow. They could be anywhere in full belly. They will probably be part of your breakfast next week. Fifth, gasped. He didn't want to eat Zer gowns. It was a cold lump in Zer's stomach. Squell caught Zer third body. Father Missisk came down the corridor double bodied. V was bigger than Squell, broad chested and square jawed, with a mane of blood red hair and sunset orange skin traced all over with white squiggles. Missisk was wearing dancing pants. V's voice was deep and rumbly, and V smelled warm, roasty, and oily. Fifth, little fifth, Z V said. Come on, let's zoom around. I'll zoom you to the bathing room. Come jump up. Gives her here, Squell. I want my gowns, Fifth said in her third body as Squell dragged her through the doorway. Here, Squell said, trying to hand Fifth's other bodies to Miss Isk, but Fifth clung to Squell. Z didn't want to zoom right now. Zooming was fun, but too wild for this day and too wild for someone who had lost her gowns. The gowns were a pale blue, soft as clouds. It whispered around Fifth's legs when he ran. Oh, Fifth, please, Squell said. You must bathe, and you will not be late today. Today of all, is he really ready for this, do you think? Miss Isk said, trying to pry Fifth away from Squell, but flinching back from prying hard enough. Oh, please, Misk, Squell said. Let's not start that, or not with me. Pip says, Father Smistria stuck their head out of the door of the studio. Why are you two winding the child up? V barked. He was tall and haggard looking and a brilliant blue skin, and a white beard worn in hundreds of tiny braids, woven with little glittering mirrors and jewels. B was wearing a slick, swirling combat suit that clung to her skinny, flat chest. Her voice was higher than Father Missisk, squeaky and gravelly at the same time. This is going to be a disaster. If you give Zir the impression that this is a day for racing about, Fifth, you will stop this now. Come on, Fifth, Missisk said co coaxingly. Put Zir down. I cannot believe you are wrestling and flying about with a steed child who in less than three hours... Oh, give it a rest, me, Missisk said, sort of threatening. B turned away from Fifth and Squell and towards Mistria. Smistria stepped fully out into the corridor, putting her face next to Missisk's. It got like thunder between them, but Fifth knew they wouldn't hit each other. Grown-up veils only hit each other on the mats. Still, he hugged Squell closer, one body squished against her soft chest, one body hugging Squell's leg, one body pulling back through the doorway, squeezed all their eyes shut and dimmed the house feed so he couldn't see that way either. Behind their eyes, Fifth could only see the pale blue gowns. It was just like in their dream. She'd lost their gowns and would have to go wearing bells like Father Frill. She shuddered. I don't want my gowns to be in the compost, Z said, as reasonably as he could manage. Oh, will you shut up about the gowns, Squell said. No one cares about your gowns. That's not true, Mrs. Boom shocked. It is true, Smistria said. And fifth, I could feel a sob ballooning inside. He tried to hold it in, but it grew and grew. And beloveds, said Father Grobert. Fifth opens her eyes. Father Grobert had come silently 
single-bodied up the corridor to stand behind Squell. Z was shorter than Miss Isk and Smithstria, the same height as Squell, but more solid, broad and flat, like a stone. When Father Grobberd stood still, it looked like Z would never move again. Zir's shift was plain and simple and white. Zir's skin was a mottled, creamy brown with the same fine golden fuzz of hair everywhere, even on top of Zir's head. Grobby, Squell said, we are trying to get Zir ready, but it's quite, well, it's Grobberd's show, Smistria said. It's up to you and Pip today, Grobberd, isn't it? So why don't you get Zir ready? Grobberd held out Zir's hand. Fifth swallowed and then slid down from Squell's arms and went to take it. Grobberd, Miss Excut, are you sure Fifth is ready for this? Is it really? Yes, Grobberd said. Then Z looked at Miss Isk, Zir's face as calm as ever. She raised one eyebrow, just a little, then looked back at Fifth's other bodies. Z held out Zir's other hand. Squell let go, and Fifth gathered herself, holding one of Father Grobberd's hands on one side and one on the other, and catching hold of the back of Grobberd's shift. They went down to the bathing room. My gowns weren't old, Fifth said, on the stairs. They came out of the oven a week ago. No, they weren't old, Robert said, but they were blue. Blue is a veil color, the color of the crushing, restless sea. You are a stayed, and today you will enter the first gate of logic. You couldn't do that wearing blue gowns. Oh, Fifth said. Robert sat by the side of the bathing pool, their hands in their lap, their legs in the water, while Fifth scrubs herself soapy. Father Grobert, Fifth said, why are you a father? What do you mean, Father uh, Grobert asked. I am your father, Fifth. You're my child. But why aren't you a mother? Mother Pip is a mother, and Z's, um, you're both. Grobert's forehead wrinkled briefly, and then it smoothed, and their lips quirked in a tiny suggestion of a smile. Aha, uh -huh, I see because you have only one staid father and the rest are veils. You think that being a father is a veilish thing to be? You think fathers should be Vs and mothers should be Zs? Fifth stopped mid scrub and frowned. What about your friends? Are all of your friends mothers states? Are they all Z or are some of them V? Robert paused a moment then gently. What about your friend Umlish Menenu of Manathis cohort? Isn't your mother a veil? Oh. Fifth said and frowned again. Well, what makes someone a mother? Your mother carried you in their womb, Fifth. You grew inside their belly, and you were born out of their vagina into the world. Some children don't, some families don't have children that way. So in some families, all the parents are fathers. But we are quite traditional. Indeed, we are all Kumruists, except for Father Firm. And Kumruists believe that biological birth is sacred. So you have a mother. Fifth knew that. Though it still seems strange. He'd been inside Mother Pip for 10 months, single-bodied, because their other two bodies hadn't been fashioned yet. That was an eerie thought. Tiny, helpless, one-bodied, unbreathing. Is there a nut-sized heart drawing nutrients from Pip's blood? Why did Pip get to be my mother? Now Grobert was clearly smiling. Have you ever tried to refuse your mother Pip anything? Fifth shook her head solemnly. It doesn't work. Z's always the younger sibling. That meant the one who won the argument. But it also meant the littlest child if there was more than one in a family. Fifth wasn't sure why it meant both of those things. Grobert chuckled. Yes, there was a little bit of debate, but I think we all knew Pip would prevail. Z had her uterus and vagina enabled and made sure we all had penises for the impregnation. It was an exciting time. Fifth pulled up the feed and looked up penises. They were for squirting sperm, which helped decide what the baby would be like. The egg could sort through all the sperm and pick the genes it wanted, but the parents had to publish something or other to get the genome approved, and after that, it got too complicated. If someone got a penis, they'd have one on each body, dangling between their legs. Do you still have penises? One on each body? Yes, I kept mine, Robert said. They went well with the rest of me, and I don't like too many changes. Can I have penises, he said? I suppose, if you like, Robert said. But not today. Today, oops, I just lost my place. What happened? I clicked in the wrong place. Ah. Oops.
Here we go. One moment, please. I clicked badly. That's why I like reading on paper. All right. I kept mine, Robert said. They went well with the rest of me, and I don't like too many changes. Can I have penises, Z said? I suppose, if you like, Robert said, but not today. Today you have something more important to do. And now I see that your father has baked you new clothes, so rinse off and let's go upstairs. I feel like that's a good place to stop. Uh, all right. <laughs> I think I'll just turn it over to Marianne. Uh, all righty. Yay! <laughs> Sorry, this whole Zoom reading thing, it's very disconcerting. Uh, <laughs> hello, everybody. Um, delighted to be here. Isn't Ben's story great? It's great. I've read the whole thing. You should all read the whole thing. It's awesome. Um, so, and and as I noted in the chat, it uh, just at WISCON a few weeks ago, um, received, uh, was placed on the honor list for the Otherwise Award, which is given for work that uh, expands our notions of gender, um, which you got a little hint of in that story so far. Um, but there's a lot more, and I love it. Okay, I'm going to read um, for about 20 minutes, and my plan is to read um, a poem, part of a story, and then a poem. Um, so I'll start with the first poem, which, um, so I, I switch genres a lot, and uh, this is from a cookbook. I wrote a Sri Lankan cookbook, um, Feast of Serendib, and then I wrote another one, Vegan Serendib, um, even though I'm not vegan, but I have um, friends who are, and I wanted them to have a book that did not have things that would distress them in it. So, uh, so this poem is called Kit and Kin. Hair, clothes, and kitchen, redolent with roasted spices, cooking deep into the night, with children and husband asleep, this much unchanged, untranslated. I stand over the pan, stirring low and slow, singing to amuse myself. Haste would destroy the spell of memory, consanguinity. Coriander, cumin, fennel, fenugreek, in order of decreasing amount. Cinnamon cloves, cardamom, curry leaves, and chili powder. If I have to look up the ingredients every time, am I insufficiently authentic? Eventually, I will grind knowledge into my bones. Amama, could you have guessed your granddaughter would live half a world away, would structure love so differently, would pass your recipes to a thousand strangers? In the old days, recipes were hoarded like gold bangles. A dowry locked in your mind could not be stolen. Now I give them away, scatter them like kisses on the networked seas. I suspect it would frighten you. What a daughter might give away, might lose forever. Yet perhaps the world is changing. A woman may give herself away, undiminished. Trust me, what the seas carried away they will return. Your children's children are with you, though at times unrecognizable. Bend down your head and breathe deep, roasting scents tangled in my hair. See, you know me still. Some things come back to you a thousandfold. So that's one. And uh, I was when I was trying to decide what to read for these things, I was this this particular reading, I was like, oh, I should probably read science fiction and fantasy, but then I was like, hmm, I can read some poetry too. And then um, and then I'd kind of forgotten, like there's a spell in this poem. Um which is entirely accidental, but there you go. Um, now the story I'm gonna read the opening to um, is uh, not yet published. It is part of Wild Cards, um, a book that is in progress. So I'm not sure how close this will be to the um, final story that comes out. Uh, I think it'll be in, uh, I think the title of the book is gonna be House Rules. This is a shared world universe where um, lots of writers come together to play in this, I don't know, there's essentially superheroes. It's complicated. 
Um, and I'm not sure if I'll get to the superhero or magic parts of it um, in today's reading, but what happens in this book is that various people come to this house um, that it turns out there is something very weird going on. It has a whole haunted house feel and um, strange things start happening. And um, the for this one, some of the Wild Cards books, we try and write as a mosaic novel where we write different chapters, but it's all supposed to feel pretty seamless. Some are short story collections um, like this one. And for this one in particular, uh, the editor is George R. R. Martin, and he encouraged us to do um, really wildly varying styles. So I'm sort of curious whether the style I was going for comes across. So uh, we'll see how it goes. I'd be feel free to throw your guesses into the chat. Um, the title is Lady Sri Extricates Herself, Emerging Not Entirely Unscathed. The weekend's adventures started so well. Sun shining, birds chirping, everything blissful in the way it only is when you're young, reasonably good looking, and quite comfortable in the financial arena. Who could have predicted that it would all fall apart so quickly? Not me, certainly. We'd stopped in a rather charming antique shop. Oh, and if you can imagine this in like an Indian British accent, that would be perfect. I can't do accents. So, but just picture that in your, in your head. We'd stopped in a rather charming antique shop on our way to Loveday House. Reggie and I had been invited to a mysterious house party. He'd been inclined to decline the invitation, perfectly content to continue rusticating with his horse and hounds. But after three months, I'd had rather enough of English country life and was clamoring for a morsel of entertainment. Since Reggie had flat out refused to take me to London again anytime soon, I had to admit my misadventures on our last visit had gotten a trifle out of hand, and it would likely take some time for that poor policeman to forget my face. I begged him to accept this invitation instead. Eventually, I wore the man down. Oh, look at this tiara, Reggie said admiringly, holding it up to glint in the light. This is rather fine, would look quite smashing with that aquamarine sari, don't you think? The one with the silver trim? Reggie has impeccable taste, which is some compensation for a host of more irritating traits. The sparkling blue and silver creation he held in one long-fingered hand would set off my black hair rather well. I'd have to wear my hair up for the proper effect, I noted. Even better, Reggie said, smiling. Then everyone could admire your horn as we dance. Oh, there is some of the little magic stuff here. So when, when in the Wild Cards universe, you catch this disease, if you catch it, odds are you're going to die. But if not, you might transform. And some people transform to what are called jokers um, and are have all kinds of physical changes that are not always easy to integrate into society. Some people become aces with superpowers. So, um, and it's called your card turning. This is the whole wild cards premise. Okay. When my card turned a few years ago, it had left me with two gifts. The first had taken some getting used to, a curving horn that rose from the back of my neck, gleaming ivory. It reminded me of a jackal's horn from the ancient legend of the Nari Kombu. Such horns were supposed to bring good luck in a variety of forms, though it certainly hadn't seemed like luck when my card first turned. In Mumbai, I'd mostly kept the horn hidden under my hair as the sight of it greatly distressed my parents. But since coming to the UK, I'd taken to revealing it on occasion. It was rather fun, shocking natives with the horn as I walked down High Street on Lord Reginald's arm. They didn't know what to make of me. With the horn came my second gift, my power, which had led me to this little shop and to the tiara that Reginald was now settling on my head. It landed with a click of rightness and the sense of relief that I felt with a good finding. A little wave of tiredness, too. It always took something out of me. The shopkeeper obligingly held up a mirror, and I nodded satisfaction. I hadn't been searching for anything in particular this time, but occasionally I found lost items anyway, and they often proved useful. I didn't know who had lost this, but perhaps its owner would turn up. In the meantime, the piece would be of more use decorating my head than sitting in the shop. Wrap it up, please. And seeing that a pair of cufflinks had caught Reggie's eye, glinting with star sapphires that matched the gems in the tiara, and those as well, please. Reggie's eyes brightened. It took so little to make him happy. If only we could have stayed that way, blissful in our ignorance. Now, 
I don't really think I can be blamed for all this folderol, no matter what Reggie says. It all started back home in Mumbai, and if pressed, I must point the finger at Auntie Anu for landing us in this mess. I was gliding along quite gracefully, dividing my time between studies at university and a rather entertaining sampling of all Mumbai's nightlife has to offer a young lady of means, which is quite a bit more than her parents or aunties might suspect. Trying to keep my love affairs untangled and out of the gossip rags was honestly so time-consuming that I hardly had time to keep up with my studies. That, I'm afraid, was my fatal error. My failing grades attracted the attention of my otherwise fairly absent father, and when it became known that I was in danger of flunking out of university altogether, there was much righteous thundering in our uptown flat. Matters devolved from there. My dearest mother was normally the most indulgent and kind-hearted of creatures who could deny nothing to her only child. Well, she became convinced that without a solid degree, I would never find a mate on the feverish Mumbai marriage market. There was much weeping and wailing, enough to set a daughter's teeth on edge and make her contemplate packing a suitcase and fleeing to the States, hoping a kindly cousin might take her in. Still, I'm confident that with a little time and a citrus application of energies, I could have recovered the situation. My mother has always been susceptible to my various persuasions, and as for my father, he'd forgotten the entire affair by the time his lunchtime biryani was served. Unfortunately, that's when Auntie Anu stepped in. She's always had far too much influence on my mother, her youngest sister, the youngest of nine, so as you can see, I have a plethora of aunts overly involved in my daily business, and she said, I quote, your daughter Sripathi is on the path to ruin. If you don't find her a husband ASAP, the girl is undoubtedly bound for a life of degradation and despair. They started parading the most appalling lot of ineligible bachelors in front of me that you can imagine. And in order not to break my poor mother's heart, I was forced to swathe myself in yards of sari, bedeck myself with the contents of her jewelry box, and bite my tongue so as to give the appearance of a properly brought up young lady. You can imagine how long that was likely to last. I made it three weeks, which I have to say is a testament to my character and strength of will, the legacy of the Chelias for generations untold. Finally, though, I broke. When faced with the last in a string of unimpressive young men, I made my excuses and fled to my friend Rupa, who's always been able to extricate me from my worst scrapes. Now, how does all that lead to me standing on the steps of Loveday House in jolly old England with a handsome lord on my arm? I can only plead temporary insanity. I arrived at Rupa's flat in rather a desperate state and laid the whole thing out for her. Rupa listened with the gravest attention while simultaneously sewing at frantic speed on her machine, undoubtedly creating one of those marvelous constructions for which she was famous throughout the city— you can see just from that what a brilliant mind she must have, and you will understand why I put myself entirely in Rupa's hands. The solution is obvious, my dear, she said, as she bent over an intricate bit of embroidery. Oh, yes? I had downed three cups of chai and at least a dozen biscuits at that point, and was feeling somewhat fortified, ready to hear what the clever girl had come up with. She threaded more gold and thread onto the machine, her brow furrowed in glorious th thought, the simplest solution to your dilemma is to get married. I became quite alarmed. No, you must be unwell. Rupa couldn't be herself to be so confused. Even though I felt quite panicked at the thought, I kept my tone moderate and gentle so as not to distress the poor creature. The goal here is not to get married. Rupa shook her head and started the machine going again, fingers flying. Don't you see? Once you're married, you'll be free to do as you please. Her words landed on me like a thunderclap. She was right, of course. It was only my unwed state that had landed me in this predicament. Once married, I no longer need to concern myself with weeping mothers, thundering fathers, or nosy aunts. For a moment, I felt I'd risen to the heights of glory. But a moment later, I came crashing down to the depths of despair. There was a flaw in dear Rupa's plan, a rather nasty fly in the proverbial ointment, as they say. I asked... But husbands can be rather controlling as well, can't they? She shrugged, and with that shrug managed to convey utter confidence, such that I was already reassured. Well, you need the right kind of husband, of course. Rupa smiled, looking up from her silken fabric with a bright countenance. By the greatest of coincidences, it must be the fates themselves intervening, the stars aligning in your favor, 
I think I know just the chap. Have you met Lord Reginald? I had, in fact. He was visiting Mumbai for the season and had been attending all the best parties, but I hadn't exchanged two words with him. I admit I mostly only went to those parties long enough to make a visible impression on the aunts and intendants and then retreated to more congenial entertainment with my own crowd in the bars and nightclubs of the city. Rupa continued as her machine word on, while he's also under a great deal of pressure to marry and secure the family line of succession. I knew his pain. My heart stirred in sympathy. Lately, my mother would not stop going on about all the grandchildren she thought I should hurry up and start producing. I confess I found myself rather despising the creatures before they even arrived. Rupa's voice dropped a register lower, and I leaned in towards her. Unfortunately, Reginald has absolutely no interest in settling down just yet, and if you can keep a secret, I assured her that, of course, I was the soul of discretion. Achelia is wholeheartedly reliable. From what I've heard, Lord Reggie isn't positive he wants to settle down with a member of the female sex when the time finally does come. He says there's so much more that the world has to offer. Oh, I would have to agree wholeheartedly, I replied. My heart swelled in sympathy once more. Clearly, this Reginald was a kindred soul. Indeed, the thought of being confined forever to the pleasures of one sex, not to mention one person, had weighed heavily on my own mind in the midst of all this marriage foufara. Rupa continued, I'm afraid he hasn't had the courage to share that revelation with his own mother yet. Say no more, I put in excitedly. I see what you're getting at. If I were to marry Reggie, it would solve both your problems. Exactly, Rupa replied. Your families would be delighted and you could continue on your own merry ways. She paused, then added discreetly, I gather also that Lord Reggie's family, while rich in titles, is also slightly embarrassed of funds. And since your own family has done so well in the pickle business, your mother would undoubtedly be thrilled at your acquiring a title. I was overcome with enthusiasm and gratitude. This is a brilliant plan and takes care of everything to perfection. I assume Lord Reggie doesn't desire to secure the line of succession imminently. There's no need for any bothersome pregnancies and the like. Oh, not for years, Rupa said. Once you're married, take the appropriate precautions. That's between you and your doctor. And after that, you can simply sigh and complain that you have not yet been blessed with such a happy event. The aunties will be forced to subside. Smashing, I said. All right, I'm going to stop there um, and uh, <laughs> leave you to that story. I wish I could tell you when it was going to come out, but I, I think it's probably at least a year away. Um, books are slow. Uh, and then um, I will read you one more poem that I thought might be appropriate for a group of writers. It's called The Shed. The shed is finished enough to work in, but has not yet entirely revealed its purposes. The shed is instead of entering the house late at night after an event, is leaving the sleeping children in the care of their sleeping father a little longer. The shed is surrounded by apartment buildings, is shielded somewhat by the grace of trees, is both hidden and exposed. The shed is an excellent place for reading late at night with wind rustling through the leaves, music turned low on a phone, not disturbing neighbors passing in the alley. The shed is for open doors and windows and as much cross breeze as possible and probably also a fan because let's be practical here. Eventually, we'll have to think about heat in winter. The shed is not for playing solitary video games. One was played experimentally and the shed was resentful. It wants to fulfill its purpose. The shed doesn't know if it will be better for writing novels in the front porch or office or living room or basement. The shed doesn't know why I wander from one to the other restlessly, endlessly. No one does. The shed is a still point in a turning, talking, asking, needing, hurting world. The shed is an impossible luxury but far cheaper than abandoning my family and running away to the ocean or the woods. The shed probably wouldn't be here if it weren't for cancer both ways. Cancer flays you down to the exhausted bone. Cancer whispers, don't wait any longer. The shed exists because the men in my life didn't understand why I wanted so badly to build a shed, but helped build it anyway. 
The shed does not want to be called a she shed because that sounds ridiculous, but acknowledges that there may be a reason for the moniker. There may be a reason why women in this world might build a shed. The shed is a poem that is trying not to need to justify its place in the world. That's it. Thanks, guys. <laughs>